Hello and welcome to this Markets Today special. I'm Udayan Mukherjee and my guest on the show today is Vetri Subramaniam, a veteran of the market and chief investment officer of UTIA Asset Management Company for many, many years. Now, Vetri, get to see you again. And it seems like in the last few days, something has changed again in the global market scene. People were seemingly very relaxed about how the Fed will ease off now and markets can sort of uh, flesh out much better starting 2023, but all that has changed since the Fed meeting. Uh, are you more apprehensive than you would have been even a week ago? Uh, good to see you there. Uh, I think if I just telescope into the issue you're raising, uh, I think perhaps the market misinterpreted uh, some of the things that came out earlier in November and uh, was looking at some of those data points, including the inflation prints, uh, to sort of start thinking about, okay, maybe we've got to hike in the first quarter, but you know, soon after that, they will have to start cutting again. Uh, mm-hmm. But I think what really came out rather forcefully, and I would say this was more so in the press conference by the uh, Federal Reserve uh, Chairman, uh, you know, Jay Powell, uh, is the fact that uh, you know they effectively continue to reiterate that this might very well be a plateau uh, where rates might remain high for a while because their target remains eventually bringing inflation down to 2%. And even though they do think there are some favorable tailwinds perhaps coming in on the good side in terms of supply chains in slightly better shape, uh, they are still concerned about what's happening on the services side of the economy and effectively uh, telegraphing to the markets that you know they would not be too put up by job losses because that would perhaps be uh, a natural outcome of the kind of inflation target that they want at 2%. So I think the markets are having to readjust that you can't really look for a Fed pivot because there is no pivot. It's looking more like a plateau. Um, And I think that's where the markets are once again starting to get nervous as to what this will mean, uh, both for financial risk, because the longer these rates stay elevated, uh, we are going to worry about who in the financial system uh, will not be able to roll over their debt simply because the cost of borrowing is too high. And the second issue is, you know, will there be a recession and how deep might it potentially go in case this is really a plateau? where rates might stay higher for longer. So I think those are the two issues that the market has had to read. How much of this has been, the two issues that you mentioned, Vetri, how much of that has been priced in already in the mild correction of the last three or four days? Or do you think we are in for a rocky few months before this gets priced in fully by the market? To be very fair, one way of thinking about this, Udian, is that if I look at the Bloomberg consensus, right, and there are forecasts available on Bloomberg for everything, Uh, And there's been a 60% probability of forecast uh, of a recession in the U.S. as per the Bloomberg numbers uh, for CY23. So you could argue that a recession is nothing that the market should be surprised about because, you know, the calculated number is 60% probability. Uh, But I think the thing which is not priced in is twofold. If rates stay at this plateau higher for longer, the recession might turn out to be much deeper. Monetary policy will not come to the rescue because the slowdown is essentially what the Federal Reserve wants in the first place. And when you look at that in the context of valuations, then you would have to worry that while the US market has corrected, there is still earnings downside. And those earnings downsides are still not in the price along with potentially lower valuations. So I would say, yes, market had an inkling of a recession that was priced in. But something deeper with significant earnings cuts has not been priced in. The second element, I think, Udian, is the one which none of us really know, uh, which is the risk of rollovers, right? Because the world has been used to easy money for quite a few years. And certainly post-2020, you know, when liquidity was poured into the system like never before. Uh, But there are initial worrying amber lights which have started to go off in the system. Uh, You can see that in the fact that the LBO market has come to a dead halt. Uh, You can see that in the fact that, you know, financing transactions that banks had already announced, uh, these are more U.S.-specific examples, 
uh, you know, the banks have actually pulled back saying, look, we can't go ahead with these financing transactions. You've had signs that maybe somebody running a large property REIT who was leveraged has actually had to put a gate on the fund because it's a leverage strategy and suddenly liquidity is starting to come short. Now, why is all of this happening? It's happening simply because people were borrowing at, you know, quarter percent, one percent. And at those sort of rates, you could have justified leverage in many financial transactions. But now when rates have moved up so dramatically and you're talking about a short term financing rate of, you know, five percent by the time we get to February, uh, suddenly rolling over that debt can make the difference between a profitable project and an unprofitable project, unprofitable leverage and profitable leverage. And I think this is a financial risk which is not yet in the price. So if there is a risk I worry about more, it's the financial risk. It's not the earnings risk, though I would say even there we haven't priced in the full degree. What does this mean for India, Vetri? Because last year the world was pretty bad. World markets were pretty bad as well, but we outperformed. And that led to some confidence that even if the world is bad in 23, once again, India will outperform. But at the start of the year, many brokerages, global brokerages are singing a very different tune. This time they're saying the outperformance has already happened. Don't expect it again this year. Do you agree with that, that having outperformed for the last 12 months, it will be more difficult to uh, do an encore this year again? I'd look at that in two, three scenarios, Udian. Uh, let me paint the first scenario for you. Uh, the first scenario actually uh, you know, is sort of contradictory to everything I said. Let's just say the U.S. recession turns out to be shallow, right? Let's just say for a moment that China gets this easy exit out of uh, zero COVID, uh, you know, into this new regime that they've got. Uh, policy in China has already turned accommodative. So let's just for a moment presume that the world surprises us with a much rosier macro outlook in 23 than what we know, uh, that what we are pricing in today. If that be the case, my sense is it's the beaten down markets that will come to the party because they're the ones who've already priced in the worst part of a downturn. So into a cyclical bounce, I won't be surprised if India actually underperforms. And I would argue if you see market performance in November and the first two weeks of December, it's got shades of that. As the world started to come to a sense that maybe things will not be so bad, you actually saw the Chinese market, some of the East Asian markets, and even the US market actually do pretty spectacularly well relative to India. So that's one scenario in which these beaten down markets could do better. I actually think that if the news gets worse in terms of the severity of the downturn, that is where I think India remains slightly better positioned, uh, whether the degree of outperformance will be as acute as it was uh, certainly in the first 10 months or nine months of 2022. Uh, hard to say it can be as dramatic as that because the valuation gap has opened up quite a bit. But I would say on balance, I would still pick India to outperform in that scenario where the downturn in 23 happens to be far more severe. And the reason for saying that is we will have second order earnings impacts in India, but the overall macro situation in India still is much superior to what it is in some of the other geographies. And I think you know that puts a buffer and that sets us up well, considering the longer term growth uh, prospects in India looking far superior to the rest of the world. So I'd say in an environment where the world actually does as bad or worse than what we are thinking today, I think India will have an advantage, but relative performance might not be as strong. Uh, I think the other sort of scenario where you would worry about can India actually underperform other parts of the world is that so far we are approaching everything with the context of everything is fine in India and there are problems in other parts of the world. If for any reason whatsoever, and we don't know what it could be, right? We never know what these things are before the event. I think over there, India becomes a bit vulnerable simply because you're already priced rather expensive for structural growth. And any cyclical setbacks we see during 23, including policy making, how to handle a high debt to GDP, the need to consolidate the fiscal deficit, going into an election in 2024, all of those could actually create a situation where India disappoints. But for India to disappoint, I think it will have to be a very India-specific disappointment that will have to come to the forefront, but that is not in the price. So that's sort of the third scenario where India could actually underperform, one in which they actually outperform, and the other one in which, because the world does better, you get a much bigger cyclical bounce there. 
The India specific disappointment that you speak of, Vetri, is it likely to be a macro setback, which the market does not see today? Or is it likely to be a micro setback, like maybe earnings coming in much lower than what has been penciled in? I think all of that is open, Udayan, uh, and I'd particularly point to two things. Certainly, earnings are at risk, uh, particularly when your starting point is elevated valuations. Valuations are not cheap. I think the second one that I would worry about is, you know, the banking system liquidity has become very, very tight. It's a good thing. India started tightening liquidity much before other parts of the world. So it's a good thing. But today, the system liquidity has almost gone to neutral. Credit is growing at 17 to 18%. Mind you, Udian, Indian companies are already doing what I talked about earlier, which means they're not borrowing overseas because the cost of rolling over that debt is too high. And they're saying we need to come back to India and borrow here because now the overseas cost is you know, not advantageous to us anymore. And we don't want to run Forex risk if we don't have to, if we don't have a natural hedge. Now, what's that resulting in? It's resulting in a bond market, which is getting very tight at the short end, right? Bank credit is growing much faster than what uh, bank deposits are growing. And I think India's challenge is, can you continue to have this situation where it's not too hot, not too cold? Or at some point, does this credit demand actually cause bond market rates to push significantly higher? And if people start to see fixed deposits rates, move you know towards the seven handle or even god forbid the eight handle i think that would seriously start to make people wonder if i can get those rates on a bank deposits then why am i looking you know at equities and that sort of messes up the argument for valuation earnings growth as well as economic outcomes in india we are in a very peculiar situation right now Udayan. you take a look at all the banks in india they are issuing bonds. They are going to the bond market. They are borrowing in CDs. They are paying 100 to 150 basis points higher than what they are paying depositors, right? So that conflict, not a conflict, but this tension has not come to the fore as yet. But if it comes to the fore and the interest rate come, including on deposits, moves up, then I think it would in some senses qualify as a little bit of a shock. It may be a growth-related shock, but still a stock shock to the system. You spoke about second-order earnings impacts in India. But are we beginning to see some of that already filter in because from, say, the kind of messaging we heard from the IT companies a week ago, from HCL Tech particularly? That's led to a setback for IT stocks immediately. Do you see more of that filtering in next year? I think there will be some impact of that, Udian. And it's not just IT, right? I mean, if you feel that IT will have a slowdown, job growth over there stalls worse, Actually, you start to see layoffs. We've heard some signs of that in the US. What if it transmits to our shores? Well, you know, the typical IT professional is a reasonably well-played individual compared to, you know, our average per capita income. They tend to keep our consumption growth rates up. They're buying property, they're buying cars. All of that will start to experience second order impacts if the IT engine slows down. Um, and I think equally, uh, you know, there are many sectors in India which have significant export linkages either because they sell overseas or they are selling products where the price is being set globally, right? So if you've got steel prices, which have currently caused steel profitability to uh, you know, witness a significant setback, how aggressive are companies going to be about their investment plans? Uh, and that will have second order impacts in terms of the expectations we have in terms of the CAPEX cycle. So, uh, that's my concern that, you know, as you see these external variables turn adverse, some of that will show up on our shores and it will either tame consumer sentiment or it will have a negative impact on the animal spirits of entrepreneurs. Mm. Right. So what's the ideal way to look at a portfolio construction if you look out into the next year, year and a half till the global mess resolves itself one way or the other. I mean, is is it going to be a replay of 2018-19 where the very expensive quality stocks come to the party once again and they keep getting more expensive, the market becomes very narrow once again? Or do you see this time uh, the playbook being slightly different? So that's an interesting question, Udian. You know, uh, when I think about this, you know, what I have been most surprised by, in, I would say, even through 2022, is as the market started to get more expensive, you may have actually seen, you know, some of the growth stocks uh, held up better than what they have so far. Uh, but I think, you know, the Russia-Ukraine conflict through a spanner in the works, if you want to say, call it that, 
because it actually caused a lot of global commodities uh, to do extremely well in the face of higher cost of capital and in the face of the risk of potential decline in demand as the world deals with a slowdown. In a normal world, this would not have happened, right? The global commodities should have sold off big time because of risk to earnings growth and equally because of a higher cost of capital. And growth names may actually have tolerated you know, these risks better simply because they traditionally have much better balance sheets. And in many cases, their growth tends to be not so economy sensitive. But we didn't see that happen because of Russia, Ukraine. Now, will that happen again? Uh, my sense is that the value trade has grown a little bit long in the tooth. Uh, because you've seen this extension of the value trade where it's done well, despite the fact that global growth is continuously, you know, sort of seeing markdowns. Uh, and therefore, I would be a little bit more concerned about that. But as investors, I'm saying, let's look at where the opportunity is. And I actually think the opportunity in India fixed income uh, is now reasonably attractive. You know, if you look at the high quality uh, portfolios that we are able to put together as fixed income managers, uh, you know, three year, five year duration products, portfolio yields, seven half, seven seventy. Uh, these are reasonably attractive yields if you've got an outlook of three to five years. So uh, stick with your long term investment in equities where you're thinking 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, SIPs, SWPs. But from an asset allocation perspective, I would urge investors to actually look seriously at you know, medium duration, high quality fixed income products in India, uh, you know, you could stagger it over the next few months, but I think these, you know, seven and a half, eight uh, percent range is a very attractive range for investors to lock into, keeping in mind what I still think is the new financial architecture for India, which is a central bank and government which have committed to four percent plus or minus two percent uh, CPI targeting, right? So if you're getting a positive yield spread of about 200 basis points, you should be looking at fixed income. And a tactical positioning, repositioning of your portfolio would also be called for because when we look at equity valuations related to bonds, it's actually the bonds which are looking more attractive today. So if you've got ability to rebalance your portfolio, you may want to consider that. Could it get even better for uh, fixed income yields, Vetri, in the next six months or so? I mean, some people are talking about, I mean, you yourself alluded to something yeah. like an 8% fixed deposit. I mean, we haven't seen those rates for a very long time. Do you think it, it could happen? It could happen. So, you know, I'm saying the, the sort of attractiveness of fixed income has gone up. It could get better. Uh, perversely, if the economy continues to sort of witness this kind of demand for money, those rates are going to push higher. But I would say these are opportunities for you to, you know, get in at those rates and think about the whole to maturity returns you can get rather than thinking about the minor capital losses you might have to take between a seven and a, a quarter percent, you know, 10 year GSEC yield going to seven half or 760. This is the time to buy. You can't catch the bottom, but you want to lock into those uh, held to maturity yields that you could get by entering fixed income today. I heard you say just now that the value trade might be a little long in the tooth right now. Would that mean that, say, sectors like a public sector banks, which started outperforming for the last six months after many, many years, do you think that trade has played itself out? It's time to take profits out of that trade? Honestly, I don't like to think of banks as you know just private or public because I think that doesn't put the right reflection of how we should think about it. But you know, I would say there are a bunch of banks in India where it's not clear to me that even under good circumstances, their return on assets is ever going to go above 1%. Uh, and I think, therefore, you know, for those banks, what you're seeing now are their best-in-class numbers. Uh, and I would look to move out of those uh, into the banks where there is a much clearer growth runway, uh, or at least they've got certain market-leading characteristics, uh, which would allow them to sort of, you know, dominate over the next uh, decade or so. Interestingly, Udayan, if you look at the numbers today, I would argue that there are about six financial institutions in India, banks, stroke lenders, who anyway account for nearly two thirds of incremental deposits and lending. And that's where you want to focus, right? Because they're the ones who are going to reap the benefits of, uh, you know, growth over the next decade. Uh, I think, you know, the sort of extreme pain to moderation trade in some of the low quality financials. Uh, I think that's done and dusted as far as I'm concerned. 
Where do you stand on CapEx plays right now, Vetri? Because that's another one where people were getting increasingly hopeful. But now if you say that growth will slow down, there's a little bit of uh, fog in the horizon with the global outcome as well. Do you see CapEx confidence go down and CapEx plays not deliver too much by way of return from here on? So then honestly, I've been a little bit wrong about uh, the CapEx plays. They've done far better than what I would have anticipated. Uh, but when you posit the question to me today, I've got to look at it in the context of where are the valuations. Uh, and I find that today's valuations are now baking in a you know, best-in-class outcome for CapEx growth over the next you know, few years or maybe even a decade. Um, I am not so clear about such a you know, positive outlook for CapEx in India. I certainly see the union government pressing um, as hard as it can on CapEx, but I don't see the states in as great financial shape uh, to press the button on CapEx. And when you look at CapEx in India, I think we should never lose sight of this fact. Union and center, a uh, union and states account for only about a third of CapEx in India. The two bigger drivers of CapEx are private corporates and households. I don't see private corporates exuding that degree of optimism, and you don't have to look far. The finance minister was recently speaking to business and industry, and she was exhorting them and saying, we've given so many breaks, but we don't see you stepping forward. And to my mind, that reflects a little bit of the lack of animal spirits among Indian entrepreneurs. As far as households are concerned, a big part of that is actually property. Now, property has actually been doing well over the last two years, but if these rates push up anymore, I would get to that point where I would worry that incremental increases in mortgage rates will dampen some of the interest that's been there in real estate. So I'm not a big bull on CapEx outcomes over the next few years. And my bigger challenge, even though I've been wrong about this, is that today's valuations don't give me enough margin of comfort given my view. Petri, always a pleasure hearing your thoughts. Thank you very much for your time today. Great talking to you again. If you like the video, do like, comment, share and subscribe.